Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. We hope that it will encourage you as you seek to follow God and grow in your faith. If you would like to know more about our church, you can check us out at www.ritmangrace.org or feel free to email us at ritmangbc at aol.com. But for right now, let's get into today's message. How are you folks doing this morning? Wonderful. I'm doing good too. Not that you ask, but hope everybody's having a good weekend though. And as I always like to say, if I've never had the chance to meet you, uh, I would love to personally meet you and meet your family after service. So feel free to stick around and I'd love to chat with you. And I always love catching up with uh, everyone. If you do attend here regularly, I always enjoy just catching up with you and seeing uh, what's going on in your life. So feel free to stick around. Don't take off too fast. Well, we are going to be continuing in the uh, current sermon series that we've been in called Know Your Enemy. And for those of you that are just now jumping in with us, uh, let me just recap a little bit. Basically, the premise of the series is this. The idea is that when we come to know Jesus, we enter into a life of conflict and a life of struggle and a life of battle. And we said this, that we come into this great conflict between good and evil And we fight evil on three fronts. We fight the evil that is within us. We said we also fight the evil that is around us. That's what we're going to talk about today, actually. And we also fight the evil that is beyond us. So we're actually taking six weeks in this sermon series. Uh, We're on uh, week five. We said we want to take six weeks, and here's what we want to do. We want to look at these three enemies of our souls. uh, The world, the flesh, and the devil. And we said that we want to take uh, two weeks for each one of those. Uh, We're talking about uh, the world today. We're going to start part one of the world. Uh, We took two weeks to talk about uh, the devil. We took two weeks to talk about the flesh. So we are talking about the world now. And the way that we're structuring this series is is really interesting. Uh, The first week, we kind of want to do a 30,000 foot view, we said. uh, Sort of a kind of an aerial recon, just kind of laying out. Uh, who is this enemy? What, what is this enemy sort of characteristically like? And then we said what we want to do the second week is we want to get a little bit more ground level in terms of how do we actually experience in real life the conflict against this particular enemy. So we did two weeks with the devil. We did two weeks with the flesh. And now we're starting part one of Uh, the world. So that's kind of the sermon series in a nutshell. And as I always say, if you missed any of these messages, you can always go to our website at rittmangrace.org and access those. We'd love to serve you in that way. Well, as we begin today's message, um, as a lead, I just want to mention uh, the Lord Jesus says to us in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, he says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So the question we want to answer this morning as we're talking about the world, we want to ask, what is, what is this world that Jesus is speaking of? What does Jesus mean when he says, in the world you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world? We really want to answer three questions this morning. We want to ask ourselves, what is this world? How does this world work? And how do we fight the world? We want to ask ourselves, what is the world? How does this world work? And how do we fight the world? So those are the questions that we want to answer this morning. And I want to encourage you to engage your minds, engage your hearts this morning with the truth of Scripture. As we try to get our minds around the question, what is the Bible talking about when it talks about the world? So let's just answer that question, the first one. What is the world at a basic level? At a concept level, what is the world? Uh, Many of us know this, but I think it's still worth mentioning. Anytime uh, you look up a word in the dictionary, which I know we just use our phones and computers now, but anytime you look up a word in the dictionary, uh, there's usually multiple meanings when you look up a word. Uh, Multiple meanings are ways that that word can be used based on its context. And the same thing is actually true when we look up uh, the word world in the Bible. In the Bible, we find that there's at least four different ways in which that word world is used in the scriptures. And so I just want to show you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, The first way it shows up is 
Uh, sometimes the word world is used in, to refer to the created order. The created order, the universe, uh, the heavens and the earth. This is what we oftentimes mean when we say, what in the world is going on here? We say that sometimes. This is what the Bible means when it says, the God who made the world and everything in it. Being Lord of heaven and earth that does not live in temples made by man. What is that? That's the created order. The Bible says that God is the creator of all that exists in the entire known universe. So sometimes when the Bible is speaking about the world, it's talking about the created order. Uh, the second meaning the Bible uses when it talks about the world is to refer to the inhabited earth. All the people on earth. Uh, this is what the Bible means when it says in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations. So this time is talking about going into all cultures, all peoples, everywhere in the world to every person and let them know the good news of Christ. So sometimes the Bible, when it uses the word world, it's referring to the created order. Sometimes it uses the word world, it's referring to the inhabited earth. The third way that the word world is used in Scripture is to speak of the realm of human life and history. So this is what you mean uh, when we say, man, that burger at the Depot restaurant was out of this world, right? Which if you haven't had a burger at the Depot restaurant, you really should. So that's your homework assignment. As if it was from another realm, though, is, is the way this the word world would be used here. This is what the Bible means in 1 Timothy when Paul writes to Timothy in the first letter and he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In other words, Jesus didn't come into the universe. He was already there. He came into the realm of human time and space and history. And that's what the Bible means occasionally when it uses the phrase the world. But the fourth meaning and the one that we want to consider this morning is this. When the Bible speaks of the world, it often is speaking of the fallen creation, the universe under the curse of sin. It's talking about the world as the kingdom of Satan, the realm that is fallen and broken and under sin and in bondage to sin and under the curse of sin. So this is what the Bible means when it says in James chapter 4, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. In the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it sums up for us pretty well the Bible's understanding of the world. Listen to what it says. The universe and all individual creatures, nature and history, are all brought under the single term cosmos, which, by the way, that's the Greek word for, for cosmos. So if you want to sound smart later, you can say, you say cosmos, right? The cosmos is the sum of the divine creation which has been shattered by the fall, which stands under the judgment of God, and in which Jesus Christ appears as the Redeemer, has become the enemy of God. It is the great obstacle to the Christian life. So I think that's a really great summary. And uh, What these writers are saying is if you take everything that the Bible means by the word world, and you just say that all of it is plunged under the curse of sin, and now is an obstacle to the Christian life under the judgment of God. That's what the Bible means when it talks about the world. So last week, if you were here, you might remember that we defined the flesh as the sin that dwells within us. If we're going to define the flesh that way, we could define the word world as the sin that is all around us. Okay, the sin that is all around us. In fact, one theologian says that the world is really just our corporate flesh. In other words, think about it this way. If you take a bunch of sinful, fallen people, which is what all of us are, and you put them together in a society, then what you end up with is something that is sort of bigger than all of them. And it begins to take on a life of itself. So when you're hanging out in the locker room or on the job site, and the guys start talking about women in a degrading and demeaning ways, what is that? That's the world. When people in your profession are cutting corners ethically and encouraging you to do the same, what is that? That's the world. The world is all of the opposition that we face because we live in a universe under the curse of sin. So the Bible, uh, when it tells us in James 4, anyone who wishes to be a friend of the world is an enemy of God, 
We have to take that seriously. If we're, if we're going to be disciples, followers of Jesus, we have to take that seriously. And what's so concerning about that is that we actually like our friendship with the world. That's our natural proclivity as human beings. We like to be friends of the world. For some of us, we might have grown up in a household with a lot of rules. That's pretty common in the church. Perhaps you grew up in a house with a lot of rules, and at some point we understand grace. And then when that happened, the pendulum swung. So now instead of putting rules in place from keeping us from interacting with the world, we have all this freedom in our interaction with the world. And the danger is that we can cultivate friendship with the world, which ultimately makes us enemies of God, according to Scripture. And it's crucial for us to understand that we cannot be a friend of the world and also be a friend of God. So if that's what the world is, then how does the world work? That's the second question we want to answer this morning. How does the world work? The way the world works is by going after our loves, our affections, and our desires. There's two uh, passages in the Bible that make this abundantly clear. Two passages that clearly show us the connection between the world and our desires. Let's look first at 1 John chapter 2. The Bible tells us, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. So notice all the language of love, and, and now he says in verse 16, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. So notice that connection that the Apostle John is making here between world and love and desire. Now notice what Paul says to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. He says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and what? What's the word? Worldly passions to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. These two writers of the New Testament, the Apostle John, the Apostle Paul, what they're doing is they're connecting for, for us both the world and desire. And the Bible wants us to understand that this is how the world operates. The world competes for your love and your affection and your desires. And the question in our discipleship to Jesus is always, what do you really want? What do you really want? That's always the core and the essential question that we need to ask. When what we want begins to become the things that are in the world, our desire for God becomes dull and diminished. Think about it this way. This is a silly illustration, but every year at Halloween, and honestly, all the time, really, I always love getting those king-size Reese's peanut butter cups. Can anybody relate to that? Am I the only one here? I especially love the king size because it gives you four instead of two, right? I'm definitely a four Reese cup kind of guy. Honestly, I could, if I really wanted to, eat like three or four of those, if I'm just being honest with you. That would be like 16 Reese peanut butter cups, if my math is right, which I'm really bad at math. But if, but if I eat 16 Reese's peanut butter cups, do you think I'm going to be hungry for the pork roast that Amanda made in the crock pot for dinner? The answer is no. I know I'm a big guy, you guys, but come on. Why? Because the candy, the candy will satisfy my hunger, but that's not how hunger is meant to be satisfied. The candy will satisfy my hunger, but that's not how hunger is meant to be satisfied. Now, why tell you that this morning? Well, I think a lot of times we're so full of the candy of the world that our appetite for God is non-existent. We're so full of the candy of the world that our appetite for God is non-existent. We're not hungry for God because we are so full of the world. Does that make sense? That's how the world works. The Bible tells us that there's a better meal that's offered to you. That there's this Thanksgiving feast that's so much more satisfying than a stomach full of sugar. And once we've tasted that meal, it's impossible to be satisfied with the candy of the world. So that brings us to our third question. How do we fight the world? How do we fight the world? If the world is really the reality of life under the curse of sin, 
And if the way the world works is by attracting our desires, by competing for our love, the question is, how do we fight the world? And I think the answer is by finding our satisfaction in God. That's how we fight the world, by finding our satisfaction in God. God is the thanksgiving feast that our soul actually desires. When we're satisfied in God, we begin to lose our appetite for the world. When we see and know the fullness of who God is and how satisfying he is, our appetite for the world begins to diminish. When you desire God, you won't chase the things of the world. So my hope this morning is that we would be a people, that we would be a church here in Rittman, Ohio, who find a deep satisfaction in God, that we would love God, and that we would begin to cultivate that love, and that we would see the world for what it really is. But we can't just stop there. Some of us might be thinking to ourselves, yep, I hear what you're saying, Pastor Clark. We've got to love God more. i just got to go home and start loving God more. I really want to love God, but... How exactly do I love God more? How do I do that? What does it take for the things that I love in the world to become less significant to me than the reality of God? How do I love God more? How do I increase my love and my appetite for God? Well, here it is. Ready? The Bible tells us that our love for God is always a response. It's a reflex of the heart to his love for us. Here's what that means. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, good memory verse, by the way, we love because he first loved, can you finish it? Us. We love because he first loved us, so we arrive at a deeper love for God when we arrive at a deeper grasp of his love for us. The more we see, the more we know, the more we experience his love for us, the greater our love for him becomes. The more we grasp grace, the deeper our love becomes. So I want to close this morning by looking at how Jesus preached grace to his disciples in order to help them overcome the world. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, verse, or excuse me, Gospel of John chapter 17. And I think what we're going to see is Jesus showing us in his high priestly prayer, that's what this passage is referred to oftentimes, Jesus is showing us in this high priestly prayer a kind of love through a deep understanding of grace. So just to frame up the context for you a little bit, this is during Passion Week. This is um, the final discourses. This is Jesus before he's uh, betrayed and arrested before the cross. Jesus is praying to his heavenly Father in John chapter 17. So let's start at verse 6 of chapter 17 of John. It says this, I have revealed to you those whom you gave me out of the world. So Jesus is telling us that God chose us out of the world and he gave us to himself, to the Lord Jesus, as his possession. Notice what it doesn't say there. It is not saying here that you took yourself out of the world. It doesn't say that you cleaned yourself up, you got your act together, you stopped doing all those bad things and then you presented yourself to God. It doesn't say that. Instead, It says, God took you out of the world, presented you to the Lord Jesus as a people belonging to him. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. So together with Christ, the grace of the gospel, God chose you out of this world and gave you to Christ. Notice what Jesus says next in verse 8. He says, For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. So this is how grace reveals itself. It reveals itself in the sense that when you hear the words of Jesus, you believe that they are true. You believe that God sent Jesus to do what he said he would do. By his grace, God takes you out of the world. And the way that that manifests itself is by you believing in Jesus. You receive him as the one who is sent from the Father. You accept his word and you receive, uh, excuse me, you accept his word. and, And we love God because, again, he first loved us. It's a response to God's love. It's a reflex of God's love. Grace is what keeps us from separatism. 
separatism. What is separatism? Separatism is one common sub-Christian way of relating to the world. What many people think is that we should just separate from the world. Separatism is when we pull away from the world, we separate ourselves. Separatism is fighting the world by way of trying to escape the world. It's the classic impulse of fundamentalism in the forms, whether it's Muslim, whether it's Jewish, whether it's Christian, it's an attempt to be pure and separate from the world by disassociating ourselves from the world. But here's the problem with separatism. When we do that, we show that we do not understand grace. And not only that, we give to the world a false picture of what the grace of God is actually like. God's grace should keep us from separatism. God's grace shows us that it's possible to be in the world, but not of the world. So here's the question that many of you are likely asking yourselves. How do we stay engaged in the world without being, being corrupted by the world? How do we stay engaged in the world without becoming corrupted by the world? If it is true that we are supposed to associate with people who don't share our worldview and our values and the things that we care about, if it's true that we're supposed to associate with other people who do not worship and love the Lord Jesus like we do, how do we do that without becoming corrupted by the world? Well, Jesus highlights the second aspect of grace, which is a word, here's another big word for you, sanctification, right? It's a word you use every day. I know you do. To sanctify something, it means to set it apart for a special use. To sanctify a person is to make him or her holy. So notice what Jesus says in verses 15 to 19 now. He says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They're not of the world, even as I am not of it. And notice, this is Jesus is talking about identity here. Not location, not geography. So when you see the word world being used here, don't think location, think identity. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Verse 17, he says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. So what that means is this, grace does not just save us, it sanctifies us. It sets us apart. It makes us holy. We're united with Jesus. Our identity is in Him. We don't love the world. We don't share the values of the world. We're set apart. We're distinct. We're different. And notice Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. I want you to notice that. What is it that sets us apart? It's the truth. The truth in who God is, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the word of God. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If you're a person who has been called by God out of the world, united with Jesus by faith, you're then sent back into the world with the truth of God and the word of God defining your whole existence. If you are sanctified, to use Jesus' word, you're set apart by grace and by God's truth. And this is the aspect of God's grace which keeps us from, here's another big word, syncretism. Can you say syncretism? Syncretism. It's like the kitchen sink, right? Retism. What is syncretism? Syncretism is the opposite of separatism. So we have separatism, and now we have syncretism. Syncretism is instead of pulling apart from the world, separatism, syncretism is when we blend in so much that we lose our distinctiveness. We become so much like the world that we basically identify with the world. Syncretism is where you're a Christian, but nobody at work knows that you're a Christian because you don't do anything different. Syncretism is where you're a Christian, but nobody at your school knows that you're a Christian. They would have asked you, they would have to ask you directly to actually find that out. You become sort of a, a chameleon, adapting to the environment that you're in. And the danger of syncretism is that it's one of those things that just happens gradually over time. It's not like when you wake up one day and you just say, you know what, I'm just going to blend in and be just like the world. 
But in a series of small compromises over time, that will eventually cause you to be exactly like the world that you're in. The reality is that most of us, if we're being honest, probably have 70, 80 years on this earth if God is gracious. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. The fight against the world is not going to be over in a month or a year or a decade. Jesus says to win this battle with the world, the battle of worldly desires over time, requires an understanding of the grace of sanctification. Knowing and understanding that you're set apart by the truth of God, by the word of God, and union with the Son of God, you're distinct, you're different. And that requires and it demands that you live distinctly and differently in the world. It is possible to be in the world, but not of the world. But only if you understand grace. If you don't understand the grace of God, if you're not gripped by the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus, you'll either become either a separatist or a syncretist. Either you'll separate yourself from the world and a desire to protect holiness or one that aligns completely with the world because you don't care about holiness. And only a deep and rich and full understanding and apprehension of God's grace can keep you grounded in the world and not of the world. So how do we fight the world? By loving God more than we love the world. That's how we do it. We love God more than we love the world. How do we become a people that love God more? Jesus says the answer is grace. Knowing that God chose us out of the world and gave us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing that we're saved by God's grace and not by our work. By understanding sanctification. Knowing and understanding that God has set you apart to live differently. Grace doesn't just save us, it changes us. It transforms us and it makes you different. It makes you distinct. And it may be even a little odd and God glorifying ways. God loves us so much that he, he loves us right where we are, but he also loves us so much that he doesn't want us to stay where we are. And that's why we need to grow in sanctification, growing more and more like Christ. Grace means that we're saved by God and that we're changed by God so that we might be the people of God who live in the world, but are not defined by the world. So, My longing for myself, my longing for my family, my longing for us as a church here in Rittman is that that we would be a people who would desperately love God. After all, that is our vision statement, that we want to have a passion for God and a compassion for people. A people who would love God more and more each day and the world less and less each day. And the only thing that Jesus says, awakens and engenders that kind of love is a continual coming back to grace, the reality of grace, continually coming back to who we were before God and before God saved us and who we are since God saved us. So let's pray and let's ask God to make us more faithfully that kind of people. Well, Lord, we we thank you for uh, your word this morning. Thank you for revealing to us and showing to us that as your followers, as your disciples, that it is possible to be a people who live in the world but are not of the world. God, I pray that you would uh, keep us from both of those pitfalls that we talked about this morning, uh, keep us away from from becoming separatists, uh, keep us from from being syncretists, uh, from from trying to blend in so much that we we lose our... uh, we're not distinct anymore. Lord, help us to, to, as you said a couple chapters earlier in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, to, to abide in you. Because after all, you are the vine and we are the branches, Jesus. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Help us to a people that, uh, that willingly uh, lay our lives, our, our own identities down and, and embrace uh, this new identity as followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. If you have questions or would like to know more about our church, please visit www.ritmangrace.org or email us at ritmangbc at aol.com.